positions. Let's go to Sunday school. All right. Uh, we've known Brother Billy Air for many years, and Annette, and uh, rejoice in the way God has worked in them and through them. And uh, we know that they've ministered in Romania uh, for a good many years, and we've appreciated their ministry there and their fellowship in the gospel. Um, just be careful. We, we loaned him a GPS many years ago, and when we got it back, it spoke Irish. <laughs> so what you learn from the message, you want, you want to be uh, Bible. You want to pick up the Bible, but don't pick up his accent. It just it, it must, must carry right through. And uh, so, but uh, we, we do appreciate their ministry. And brother, would you come and open the word for us this morning? Thank you. I didn't know about the GPS. <laughs> Sometimes we do that sort of thing just for something different, you know. <laughs> when you travel around the car, you, you know, just change it around a little bit. A few years ago, we were traveling around Europe and we had Annette's mom and dad with us and we were on our way to Poland because um, Annette's on her mother's side. The family comes from Poland originally. So we thought we'd go up there and we had it in Romania and given all the directions and the uh, in-laws couldn't um, put up with this. So we had to flick around and convert it back into English again um, for them. But anyway, it's great for me to be here and for Annette to be here this morning. I have not been in this building before. Um, praise the Lord for you, you have your own building and uh, many churches around the world do not have their own buildings but uh, um, it's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning um, I want to speak to you a little bit about Romania and then we'll get into the word um, in July 2005 I arrived in Romania I was there three months ahead of the family um, trying to get things set up um, for our relocating over there we saw the, the Lord move and um, and preparing uh, us for Romania and also um, we're just working in our hearts and opening doors that we thought were going to be hard to open. At that time, Romania w had not joined the EU and they were still under the communist mindset when you had to go there with all your paperwork and go to the office to fill in paperwork and get a visa and then they say, in the end, I've been there two or three times and say, give me the list with everything I need to get because I'm tired of driving a round trip of 200 plus kilometers to get this paperwork done. And they'd write out a final list and then you'd come back the next time and they said, oh, there's another two things you have to get, but they're not on the list. You give me the list. Oh, you should know. I said, if you don't tell me, uh, we don't know. So we had a lot of settling in to do there and to learn um, over there. But we have seen the Lord working in the country and also working in our own hearts. We've been to places and we've done things that we didn't think were possible. And we thank you for your prayers and for your faithfulness here at Crossroads Baptist Church, for your faithfulness, how you've allowed the Lord, um, your faithfulness to us as you have served the Lord and how you've allowed the Lord to use you as a channel of blessing. We really appreciate that. Some years ago in 2005, like I said, I arrived there in 2007, or earlier in the year, we started Bible Institute there. At one stage, we had 11 young men that were coming to Bible Institute. And there was a young guy called Nico Shore. Nico, he doesn't like the full name Nico Shore. Um, he um, heard about that we'd started Bible Institute. And the Lord had put a burden on his heart that he thought he'd like to train for ministry. Um, some years earlier. He was working in Serbia and at that time his sister contacted him and told him that a Bible Institute had started in, um, in Moldova Noah area and there was an Australian missionary there and um, so she contacted him I think on a Saturday he was in Serbia working he quit his job immediately he thumbed the lift back into Romania over the Serbian Romanian border uh, went to church on Sunday and started a Bible Institute with or started work with us because we had been working in making up um, concrete blocks, the things we were going to use for building the campsite. 
He started work with us on the Monday. So that Saturday he heard, sun, um, thumbed the lift straight away, went to church on Sunday, started work with us on Monday, and started institute on Thursday night with us all in that short time. And after a year or so, Nico came to me one day, and he said to me, I've got two things I want to ask you, Brother Billy. Brother Billy. And I said, what is that? And he said, um, I want you to train me uh, for the ministry. I want to be a pastor. I believe that God's called me to be a pastor. And I said, right, we can do that straight away. That's what we're here for, um, to train young men for the ministry. And I can help you with that request straight away. And I said, what's the second request? And he said, um, I want to marry your daughter. <laughs> and I said, well, what we'll do is we'll, the first request, we're straight on to that, okay? We're doing that straight away. But with the second request, you'll have to wait. Okay, she was only young then, and I said, you'll have to wait a little while, and he waited five years, and they were married in um, September 2012, okay? Now, Nico has been with me since 2007, and um, over the last few years, the Lord has put on our heart to return to Australia. Um, we realize it's going to be hard settling back into the country again, and... Um, and when I first went over to Romania, I knew that eventually um, we have to hand over the work. We, we're taught in college, and we know by the word of God that you're to do yourself out of a job, okay? Well, I've I'm currently unemployed. I've done myself out of a job, and I've handed over the work to Nico and um, married to our daughter, Caitlin, and uh, he's taken up the, the mantle, so to speak, and he's a good preacher, and he does um, translating work uh, from English into Romanian. He also speaks Serbian, so three languages. Um, so he, he does the translating work for Sunday school material um, from English. There's lots of more study material in English, so he translates from English into Romanian for Sunday school. He also looks after um, 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 Kids Club and um, also uh, teenage group, um, what do you call it? Teenagers, is that right? Mm -hmm. I said that right? Youth group, okay. Um, so he looks after that. Um, usually at, the, uh, at this time, it's only once a month with the teenagers. There's, we've had a lot of teenagers that have come through the church there in Moldova Noah, and there's been a great falling away. They get to this uh, 15, 16 years of age, around about the 15 years of age, and they get enticed into the world they see all their classmates in school um, are in the world and off the world, and they get enticed into the world. And we've seen a lot of young people that have come through the church and that have been pulled away. And we've seen even a young lady who has uh, been with the church since she was 12, and she was 18 and got enticed into the world and made a right mess of her life. And just a few months before Annette left, she met with um, Christina in the shop where she was working in the pizzeria, no? And uh, she met her in there, and Annette said, How, how's things going? She said, not so good, and she burst into tears. So Annette said, well, the door for the church is always open. We, we've always, le always left the door open for the church. We've not closed the door on anybody. And that's the way it is with the church. The church is a spiritual hospital. And when you get people there, they've all got different things. When they come, they've all got different problems when they come to church. And we need to be there to serve them. And by serving them, we're serving the Lord. And to build them up in their spiritual faith. And to challenge them to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And to walk on in faith with him. Um, anything else? Yes, I want you to know that we pray um, for things around the world. Um, our contacts here back in Australia. We've been praying for many people over the years um, that uh, the people in our church in Moldova Noah will never meet you this side of eternity, but be rest assured that there'll be a great reunion in the heavenly places. And we pray for Caleb as we went back to Mauritius there a little while back. These people are praying for people and it, sometimes they find it hard to pronounce the Anglo-Saxon, English sort of names, and um, but they pray for these people. Sometimes we have to um, make a changing, a change to the spelling of your name, so they can pronounce it properly. But rest assured, we've been praying for the mission um, there in Mauritius and for many other works around the, around.
Australia and other countries around the world. We've been praying for the um, Harrisons and for their visa and for various different things. I just want you to know that um, people are praying um, for the, the word to go forward and for many people to come to know Christ the Savior. Okay. I want you to turn your passage with me today in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. What I'll do is I'll do a bit of an introduction. I'll change it around a little bit. I'll do a bit of an introduction. And while you're looking up Luke chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 1 to 21. When the Lord Jesus was here upon the earth, we know that he was here before the beginning of the earth. But um, when he was here physically upon the earth, he spent lots of time training men. Okay? He trained first the 12. Then we see here in our passage the sending forth of the 70. And he invested his life in training men to go forward with the gospel message. Now, in order to train them, a lot of things had to be changed in their lives. Their mindset ha had to be changed. For example... Remember it says in the scriptures in um, John chapter 4 that he must needs go through Samaria, okay? Now the Jews, as you know, they hated the Samaritans. They were a mixed group, Jewish and um, uh, uh, mixed um, nation there. And the Jews say, hey, we are of the real pedigree. We're the real thing. We're the real McCoy. Um, you guys are just an intermixed group of people and we don't like you, Okay. And in the world, um, we see that um, people who don't like each other, we call it racial tension, but that's not true. That word is not correct, okay? God only made one race. We're all of one blood, okay? There's um, prejudices to various different groups around the world where um, one group of people don't particularly like another group of people. The um, Serbians and the Croatians are always fighting. Okay, the Irish still haven't sorted it out after a thousand years. They're still fighting amongst themselves over there. And I can say that because I'm from there, okay? Um, but um, there's various different groups around the world that ha have this dislike of other people, and it's ingrained in them. And this is what the Lord Jesus was having to put up with. He had to change the mindset of his uh, disciples, they had to tell them stories about the Good Samaritan. Remember the Samaritans? They weren't very well liked, okay? Um, so he had to, to change their mindset there. Um, he, had, he told them the story of the Good Samaritan. He told them the story of the ten lepers that were healed. Remember, they cried out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us. And he said, well, you guys, you make your way to the, to the, the, the temple there, and you show the high priests there that you've been cleansed. So we know the ten went there, and only one came back. And the one that came back, what did the Lord say? And here has come this stranger, this Samaritan, came back to give glory to God. And Jesus said to them, were there not ten? Where are the other nine? And he turned around to his disciples and said, this foreigner, this stranger came back, and he's a Samaritan, and he came to return glory and give glory unto the Lord. So I want us to think about these things when we read this passage. Now in Romania, we have some funny, quirky things we do over there, okay? For example, um, I don't know why, but I can't see any problem with it. Um, we sit down to sing all the time. Occasionally, we'll get people to stand up and sing, but the, over there, it's not normal to stand up and sing, okay? That might sound quirky to you, but everybody, when we read the Word of God, everybody must stand. Okay, would you do that with me this morning, okay? We always do that um, to, uh, to get people to stand, so I don't know if you're used to that, but anyway, we'll do that this morning, okay? Luke chapter 10, I want to read verses 1 to 21. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord, therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor script, 
nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. <coughs> and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be unto this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, and into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which claveth unto us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works would have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thy Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you and heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from the heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice, not that your spirits are subject, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it deemed good in thy sight. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come before you this morning. We pray that you will bless your word this morning. We know that in the scriptures it says that your word will not return without fruit, Lord, without um, It will not return void, Lord. We just pray that you work in our hearts. Help us to be uh, rejuvenated, Lord, to be rechallenged, Lord, and to be about our Father's business. This I ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. M maybe for ma many of us, we haven't seriously sat down and thought about how the life of Jesus was. He was busy from noon till night. He was busy all the time. His life was, um, he was on a constant move. There was people there asking him questions all, all the day. There was lots of stress. There was people threatening to kill him. There was many, many stresses that he went through that we, we don't go through. Okay? And part of the scriptures it says, you have not resisted unto blood. But here in Jesus' life, he went through many stresses. He suffered a lot. He traveled a lot. And he didn't have any peace. But here... He came to share, the, to bring the gospel and to show people the way towards heaven and to pre prepare men, servants, for the future when he will be gone. That was his main idea. He's come. He's going to share his time. Remember when he got first called the twelve? And he sent them out two by two, also similar to this passage. And he sent them out two by two. We see there, we'll call it a baton change. Now, Pastor Brad mentioned something about the, the relay race and his message at the... At the uh, oh, thanks, brother. Thank you. So he uh, mentioned something about the relay uh, race. 
Let us think of after about two years, Jesus had been there, he'd been working with his disciples. In Romanian, we use this word, um, the, the disciples like an apprentice, okay? He's not just a learner. In the Romanian Bible, it says he's like a, a, um, an apprentice, okay? He's with the master, he's serving his time. He First, he's watching the master, He's observing what he's doing, and then after a while, when I was doing my plumbing apprenticeship, after a while I worked with the man, I watched what he was doing, I handed him all the tools, and he'd, he'd, he said to me, oh, where's the hexo, where's the soldering iron, where's the whatever, I need the flux, I need whatever, and at the beginning I, I was just handing, hand, um, handing him things. After a little while, I knew before he asked what to give him, okay? because I was watching and observing, and then he came and he said to me, okay, your turn. And then I'd do it, and he said, no, no, you don't do it like that, you do it like this, and it would be easier to do it like that, and he gave me instructions. So this is what the Lord was doing with his disciples for about two years. And you know with the relay race, um, when you run in the relay race, it's been a long time since I've run in a relay race, okay? I used to like running, okay? And... Um, and gymnastics and all that sort of stuff many, 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 many years ago, okay? But when you run in a relay race, when you go and you hand the baton over to someone, I think you have to change. You've got 20 meters in which to do the exchange, okay? So you run along um, with the person you're about to hand off the baton to. You have a 20 meters in which to do the exchange. And when you hand that baton over, um, he's ready to go. So he's got a 20 meter pickup zone, okay? We'll call it that, okay? Well, here we see Jesus. He's been running with the disciples, and he's passing the baton on. He's had a pickup zone for about 20 meters with them, so to speak, okay? We're not talking about physical here, okay? In your life, have you got someone running, ready to change the baton to have you got some and you're running alongside, you're ready to pass over the baton to them? You spend a little bit of time with them, you've given some instruction to them, you've um, helped them to build them up in, in their faith? Well, that's what it's all about, okay? Because before you got saved, there was someone that passed the baton to you. And before the, the, they got saved, there was someone passed the baton to them. And so it's been for about the last 2,000 years. Okay, so here we see the disciples, this is the 20, uh, the 70, sorry, they're about to be sent out. Okay, uh, Jesus is preparing men for the future because he knows that soon he's going to go to that old wooden cross. He's going to be sacrificed there for his, not for his sins, but for your sins and for my sins. And he's going to pass the baton over to these men and they're going to continue the work. So here we see in our passage, it's very clear, Jesus had many servants, not just the 12. And after, his, uh, after he will be gone, that the gospel message was sent out and preached throughout all the world. So we see many instructions that are given here for the seventh day. They received the instructions and they repeated what was, uh, basically that's a repeat of what was happening for the 12 that went on. In verse 1 it tells us that he sent them out two by two before himself. Let's say that again. And after this the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. So here we see preparation, okay? I don't know any farmers that go and they, they wake up in the morning, they sit around the, um, the farmer and his wife and they're sitting around the, the, with a cup of tea in the morning and she says, uh, what are you doing today, love? And he says, well, you know that old paddock that we haven't done anything? You know, the one the grass is up to your hips sort of thing? And I just thought I'd go and throw some seed down there this morning. What do you reckon? It doesn't work like that, does it? What does the farmer have to do? And what do you have to do in your life? There has to be preparation time, okay? That grass has to be cut down, and the soil has to be turned over, it has to be prepared in order to receive the seed. So here we see that Jesus is going to send out the seven day. They're going to do some preparation on the things that they've learned. They're going to do some preparation 
preparation for the soil, for the ground, because he's coming that way. So that's, he sends out the 70 before his face to the place that he will go. He's going to travel through them cities, he's going to travel through them villages, and he's going to um, preach the gospel there, but they're going to go ahead of him and do a bit of grand preparation. <coughs> Nothing will change in your life until you've done some grand preparation. And here we're not talking about the soil out there, okay, that the grass needs cut. We're talking about grand preparation where you live. Grand preparation in your family. Grand preparation amongst your community or amongst your neighbors that are around you. Because everybody watches you. I, every time I went into town in uh, Moldovanoa, I went to pay the water bill, okay, and I walked into the office, opened the door, walked into the office, and I come and said, uh, my name? I said, we're not. What do you mean you know? He says, I've already got it on the computer. Everybody knew who I was. Everybody knew who my wife was around time. So we're going to pay the water bill and they already had it up on the screen. I'm um, from this apartment block and this uh, apartment I live. Yeah, we know. It's all up here. How much you want to pay? Okay. They knew. Every time I went to do something, um, people knew who I was. In anything like that, they knew who I was. And people know who you are. They know that on a Sunday morning you get up and you go and you go to church. They know that if you're going to a prayer meeting during the middle of the week, they know who you are and where you're going. So in your life, there's preparation. And nothing is going to change until you start preparing the ground to reach for, for, for the people. Your next door neighbors, those in your family, um, for Jesus to enter into the conversation. Because after a while, Jesus is going to come. Okay? Sometimes people go and they, they knock on a door and they get into a heated argument about religion. Okay. Do you know anybody that's been won to cross by a heated argument? I haven't heard of one. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's happened. I haven't heard of one. Okay? But people are watching you and they want to see that you're the real deal. Okay. One thing in Romania I didn't like was every time I went somewhere, they called me the priest. Okay. I was the Baptist priest. I didn't like that word priest, okay? and I, I still can't stand it. And I said, no, I'm pastor, okay? I said, no, preoto, okay? the priest. Okay? But I didn't like that. But anyway, people are watching you, but what are they saying? So Jesus sends out the, the, the 70 here. <coughs> they go out and they've been given specific instructions. I want you to turn to, with me to Matthew chapter 10. And I want to read verses 5 and 6. And the twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles at this time, okay, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not at this time, okay? But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So here we see the mission <coughs> is only Pento uh, sorry, it's only for Israel, okay? For the ones, the lost sheep of Israel. In verse 7, keep your Bible open there at Matthew chapter 10. Verse 7, it says, as ye, but, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the message of salvation is coming to you. I'm, I'm waiting on a response. The ability for you to be saved is here. Okay? When you go, if you door knock to people, if you speak to your neighbor, and you're sharing the gospel with them, um, the ability... For them to have eternal life is available, isn't it? Okay. All is depending upon their response. So the message of God is available. The ways and the means of being saved is available. It all depends on their response. You've offered eternal life when you speak to them, but is it 
it is a decision that the person has to make. You can't force someone to be saved. You know, we've had some young people through the doors at, um, in Moldova and all, like I've told you, and you, you see if they don't make a decision in their life, especially young ladies that have come through, 14, 15, and you see that the, if they don't make a decision now, a hard, firm decision, they're going to go off like the rest into the world. A couple of years ago, we held um, junior camp. Um, it was nearly all girls. I think we had one boy and 14 girls or something at um, junior camp. Okay, And um, we got there, and I was telling the girls uh, to be careful how they live, to be careful and not give themselves away to young men. And the boy will come and tell he loves you, and he doesn't love you. He just wants something off you, and then he'll kick you to the to this footpath, they'll kick you to the side, and they laughed. Oh, it won't happen to us. Do you know it was 12 months later? We had none of these girls here. You know what happened to them? They went and did what we tried to tell them that they would do if they don't get a firm hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't listen to the message. So here we see that Jesus has sent forth the, the 12 at this time in Matthew chapter 10. It's only for the lost sheep of Israel. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, The message of salvation is at hand. You've explained the gospel to someone and the decision is up to them. In verse 11 in the same passage. <coughs> and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who is in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. Thence. Okay. Who's worthy to be saved? Or what's it mean here? What, what's, what's it mean to be worthy? I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you have put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So we go back in our passage and we say, Who is worthy? The ones that are ready to receive the message. Okay, they're the ones that have um, judged themselves worthy. We want to listen to this message. We want to listen to what this man has to tell us about eternal life, about salvation, about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here that Jesus has given instructions. And we need to look for people who are ready to receive the message. That doesn't mean that you don't witness to other people. That doesn't mean that you don't share the gospel with other people. Many, many years ago in Tamworth, I was out door knocking. And we um, knocked on the door of one, of the, one fellow during the, uh, the middle of the week, myself and another guy. And we were there, and we met this German guy. Okay? And he was one of these uh, Germans that had swallowed this um, hard criticism. Okay? And we spent about three hours with this fellow. And all he wanted to do was play spiritual ping pong. If you understand what I'm saying. He wanted a debate. And we stayed there. And we shared the gospel with him. We opened the Bible up to him. We showed him things. We talked about his, um, all his uh, Schurl marker and all them sort of characters. And <coughs> Tulloch and all them guys. That, uh, all the critics. And we spent time with this with guy, and we spent time with him. And after I walked away with my uh, brother from the church, and I said, you know, you know, brother, I think we wasted some time here. All this guy wanted to do was have a debate. All this guy wanted to do was uh, to, to show how clever he was and how educated he was and sophisticated that he was. And I think we, went, we wasted some time. And he said, I think you're right. So when we go and we're sharing the gospel with people, we have to um, be ready to be sensitive to them. We share the gospel with them, and we invest time in those that are ready to listen. Okay? 
that doesn't mean that we go in and say, oh, well, you didn't receive the message, go to hell sort of thing. And we, we, we don't do that, okay? But every time we go and we share the gospel with that person, do you know that there might have been someone that shared the gospel with them before? Do you know that there might be someone that comes behind you and shares the gospel and they might be ready? How many people here today could honestly say, look, I heard the gospel message when I was 12, 14, 15, and, um, and the first time I heard it, I got saved. Not many of us, is it? We've heard the message. We were dull of hearing. We weren't ready at that time. But here in the passage it says, go and look for those that are worthy. Go and l the people that are ready to receive the message, stay there. Jesus talks about going to that city, uh, offer your peace unto them. If they receive you, stay with them. Share the gospel with them. Invest in them. In Luke chapter 10, back to our passage again, verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest is truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. There's a great harvest out there. Sometimes we pray and we say, Lord, Lord, can you take us up? We see the world getting worse and worse all the time. We see all these different things that are changing in society, how the laws are changing, how the marriage, um, who can be married to who and what is changing. We see all the evil that's coming into the world that uh, in, in schools around the place and in, in Australia. Oh, you're not allowed to preach the gospel in this school. No, you can't have RE classes in this um, school, but you can have them in another school. We see all these things that are changing. We say, Lord, take us home. Lord, I want to hear the sound of that trumpet take us home. But the Lord is not yet. Not yet. Because there's a harvest out there. And we must be about our Father's business. We must be seeking those who are lost. We must be investing time in people and spending time talking to people and showing them the gospel. Not just through your living, but sharing the word with them. All Christians have been sent out by Christ, or by God, to share the gospel. Many in the world are tied. You don't see the ties. The ties of problems in their lives. Alcohol. The ties of sin in their lives. Want to be famous. Want to have a lot of money. It doesn't matter what it is. They're tired. Because the, Lord, uh, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. They think if they grow up in this world and they get a lot of money together and they have a comfortable life and they have a nice car out the front and they have a nice villa to live in, that they're getting somewhere. They think if they're famous and the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And we need to share time with them and show them, hey, we want to share with you about the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to show you that there's something much better than this um, here upon the earth. In verse 3, the Lord Jesus says um, to the ones he sent out, what does he say to them? Go, ye, go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. What's that like today? Okay. I was in Tamworth about three years ago, two or three years ago, and I preached the message. We had to take it down. I said something against a certain group of people, and you can't have that, apparently. Are we not like lambs among wolves today? And everything in the world, in the Western world, is tolerated today except for one thing. When you go out and share your faith with someone and say, yeah, I'm a Christian, no, a few years, years ago in England, there was a young man that saw someone that was hurt, and he offered um, assistance to this person that was lying on the footpath. A young man, I can't remember the, the suburb in outer London, 
and he got down and he saw the man was in grave, uh, the person was in grave um, condition. So he got down and he spoke to the person and comforted the person and said, did you mind if I prayed for you? And the person lying there said, uh, yeah, thank you. So the person prayed for them. Anyway, the person died. The family was greatly offended that this young man had prayed for the relative that was lying on the ground about to die, that they were offended. This young man lost his job. He worked for one of the consuls over there. He lost his job there. Why? What did he have done? What great offense did he have? Did he, he attack the person? Did he kill the person? Did he run them over with the car? Did he assault them in any way? Apparently so. He assaulted them by praying for them. And the family was greatly offended. Haven't things changed around the world? Are we not lambs amongst wolves today? That every time you get up and you give your opinion about a certain thing um, <clears throat> in society, everything's acceptable except when you say, Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to save you. Jesus wants to, you, you, you to come to him and have eternal life. Or can I pray for you? And people get offended. We do live in a strange world. We say, Lord, why don't you take us out of here? Why don't you just take us home? Why can't the rapture happen today? Here and now, and we'll be out of here. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we need to keep that in the back of our mind, that we're not here on holiday. Okay, there's a great holiday that we'll have up there for all of eternity. We'll be able to go and visit each other and, um, for many, many, many years. You can't overstay your welcome up there. Okay? But here is work time. Here is time for us to work. The light is not going to be here for long um, when man can work no more. The Lord said, take with you, what did he say? To take with him. Carry neither purse, nor script, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. You know when we go anywhere and we do anything, you always have to have something in reserve, don't you? You know, you have your spare wheel in your car in case you get a puncture. You take another jacket or a pair of trousers in case something happens to you while you're traveling somewhere. But here, the Lord says, don't salute anybody in the way. Focus. Sometimes we lose our focus, don't we? We get tied up with life, and we, we think, Lord, um, I'm, I'm very busy. And we've got all these things to do. We've got A, B, C, and D. We've got to cover all these things. We've got to do all these things. And sometimes we lose our focus. What is our focus as a Christian? Is our focus as a Christian to gather great things around us and have great uh, goods around us and uh, to be comfortable? No, that's not our focus as a Christian. Our focus is to be concentrating on the call for which we are called to. We were saved, someone went out of their way and they shared the gospel with us. And we need to be ready like that too. Many years ago, I, um, I thought about a young man. I was just talking about when we share the gospel with someone, if you don't reap at that time, I thought about a young man. Many, many years ago, I used to drive a truck for a turkey farm, okay? For seven years, I drove a truck for, <laughs> and worked on the turkey farm. I was gonna say that not all the turkeys had feathers on the farm. We had a funny, strange group that guys worked there, but um, anyway, that's another story. But um, when I was working on the turkey farm, the, every Monday morning I used to pick up a young guy uh, in the truck at about 2.30 in the morning, and I'd drop him off out in the outer suburbs of Newcastle, and he'd go to the university there. And I did this for a few years, 2.30 pick up on a Monday morning. He went there, went to university, stayed there all week, then got home on a Friday night with a train or something like that, and then I'd, pick, I'd drop him. And every time uh, he jumped in, the, the cab with me, he was a captive audience, okay? He wasn't saved. His cousin had said, Billy, Brother Billy, could you um, share the gospel with Darren? And I said, okay, I'll share the gospel with him. And I spoke to him. <coughs> As we drove along, he couldn't jump out and run away. We were going 100 kilometers an hour on the motorway, so we couldn't get out. Um, anyway, we're driving along, and I shared the gospel with him, and nothing. Nothing. Then after many, many years, he rang me up one day, and he said, um, Billy? And I said, yes. 
who is it? He said, Darren. And I said, Darren who? I don't, I don't know who you are. I can't remember. And he said, you used to, I used to drive in traffic with you every Monday morning. You dropped me off. So I could go to uni. Oh, yes. And I said, I got saved yesterday. And I wanted you to know that when this guy was speaking to me, that all them things that you'd mentioned all flooded back to mind. And I got saved yesterday, and I wanted you to be one of the first to know. So when we share the gospel, when we invest in people, you might think, oh, for knocking I've done this. The time that I've wasted, the time that I've invested, don't take that time and think, I've wasted that time. If you've done it for Christ, you haven't wasted any time. I hope this is making sense. I'm not sure. I hope so. Okay? But Jesus wanted to teach his disciples, don't take anything with you. Don't depend on you and op upon your great um, knowledge or your great um, self-dependence, because I don't want your self-dependence. I want your utter dependence upon me. Okay? When you become a Christian, your utter dependence has to be upon God. 17 years ago, we left, and I went with two suitcases to Romania. Um, about six weeks ago, I came back with two suitcases from Romania. Okay? And we thought, Lord, what do we do now? How are we going to go about this? And a few weeks ago, my daughter Lisa, who's here, was contacted by a contact of hers. A um, young man from a church that she and Brian, her husband, used to go to. And he said, do you know anybody that um, requires furniture? Or my dad's passed away and he's got a full household of furniture. Do you know anybody? And Lisa said, oh, oh, hold on a minute. My parents are coming back. Yeah, thank you. Yesterday we packed up the truck. We went to pick up the truck yesterday. And we thought, oh, no, we got up in the morning and we thought, oh, it's going to rain. It's supposed to pour down and rain at 9 o'clock in the morning. Praise the Lord that the uh, forecast was wrong, okay? We got there at 9 o'clock in the morning. We packed the truck and um, all in the dry. We packed up the truck. We locked it up and we drove it ar around. We parked it in front of Lisa's house. And at 1 o'clock it started to pour. So God is there and he's working in the background, even the little things. He's there and... Um, He's working. So Jesus said, go into the places where you go. If the people receive you, stay there. Invest your time. Share the gospel with them. And if they're willing to hear the gospel, keep going. Keep going, because that's what you're here for. And verse 9, it tells us, and heal the sick, and they, they that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. The gospel message is here. Are you ready to receive it? Do you know that you're born a sinner, that you came into this world? Born in sin? For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God? Do you want to get saved? Do you want to uh, give your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ? The message is here. Are you ready to receive? Salvation was first offered... And it's at the door. What does it require? Faith. I believe everybody in the world has faith. But is it the correct faith? Today we hear all over the world about different faiths. Remember the Lord Jesus when he spoke to the woman at Samaria? You worship, you know what not. You know not what. Because salvation is of the Jews. Okay. And he shared with them and this woman, and she came to know Christ the Savior. But faith has to be the correct faith. It has to be a decision that people have made. We don't want words that people spill out words. Do you want to get saved? Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to burn in hell forever? Or do you want to get saved and go to the nice place and walk around the streets of gold and be there in comfort for the rest of the night? Oh, yes, we'll choose the, the, the best option. We'll go there. I want to be in comfort. I want to walk the streets of gold. I want to be, have eternal life. Yes, 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 yes. But do they understand it? Do we share our faith and say, hold on a minute. When you become a Christian... Things don't change automatically around you, okay? The peace is within. It may not change your circumstances. 
it may, it may not change the, way, the hardness and the things and the little tribulations that you're going through in life, but you'll have Christ within, okay? I like to, when I share the gospel with someone, I like to sit down and spend some time with them, okay? I'm not in for this quick believism, whatever they call it, you know, a lot of words strung out and say, pray this prayer and now you're saved. I don't do that, okay? Actually, a few years ago, I shared the gospel with a young man, and I sat down in the office, and I tried to dissuade him, because I wanted to know he was serious. He said, no, I want to get saved. I know what I have to do, I realize what I'm doing, and I want it, okay? And that's what you want. When you invest time with people, that's what you want. You don't want quick professions and no possessions. You want people to come to know Christ the Savior. Because it's an important decision. When someone makes a decision to come to Christ, you want to know that they've done it with all their heart. Remember the Pharisee who came to Jesus one day? He says, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? And the Lord said to him, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, so, you know, with all thy strength and everything, and to love your neighbor as, this, as yourself. And he said to Jesus, yes, that's correct. What you've said is correct. Good answer, basically. And Jesus said to him, he looked at him, and he said, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. You're not far. He didn't say, welcome to the kingdom of heaven. He said, welcome to being saved. He didn't say that. He said, you're not far. There's a few more things that need to be done. You have to go on out a few steps. You have to come and put your faith in the Lord. You have to come and receive Christ as your Savior. You're not far from heaven, but not far can be too far. In Romania, as an Orthodox country, it was a few, a few weeks ago, a young man turned up at a faith church at Blacktown. I didn't know. I went there one Sunday night, and a young guy, a, a guy turned up that they'd, uh, they'd met on door knocking. And the first time for this guy to be there, and I would just happened to be there by accident or so, I thought. And the guy was a Romanian guy that turned up there that night. I was able to have a chat with him. And the guards came along and they said, oh, this guy's just got saved on door knocking this afternoon. I said, can I have a <laughs> chat with him? And they said, yeah, go ahead. So I sat down and we were having a meal afterwards and we're sitting there and we're having a conversation with him. And he said, uh, I'm a great sinner. And I said, yeah. I said, do you know Christ as Savior? Has there been a time in your life, can you think back when you call Christ to be your Savior and ask him for forgiveness of sin and to come into your life and to be your own personal Savior? He says, I haven't done that. I says, that's what we're talking about here today. He told the guys that he was a Christian. Okay. You know why? Because he went to the Orthodox Church. He brought up in the Orthodox Church. When he was a baby, they threw water around him. Actually, they dunked him in the water. Okay. They put him in the water. They told his, his mother and father, and the priest told them that he was, not, he was, a, he was a Christian or not. And he brought up all his life. So when they said to him, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. I've been a Christian all my life. Yeah, really? And so when we talk to people, we have to know where they're coming from. We have to share the gospel with them for them to understand what the gospel said and is saying on how to come to know Christ the Savior. So we don't have no misunderstandings. Okay. It's the same when you go to, I was speaking to a Catholic guy many, many years ago, and I was with the guy, I was door knocking, the guy said to him, are you, are, are, have you received Christ as Savior? Oh, yeah. I said, good. I said, um, can I speak? And he said, yeah. I said, did you receive Christ as Savior last Sunday? As uh, Christ uh, last Sunday? And he said, yeah, how would you know that? I said, um, you're, are you a Roman Catholic? And he said, yes, yeah. And I said, so we went forward in the church and the priest said, well, it's time for the communion. So everybody comes forward and they all kneel at the altar and they come to receive our Jesus Christ with the paper, with the wafer, receive our Jesus Christ. So he thought that's what you're saving Jesus Christ, okay? 
So you have to give people and their mindset for, them to, for you to understand where they are so that you can reach them with the gospel message. Then Christ said to them uh, in verse 10, but into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out of the, into the streets of the same and say, and he gives, and, and the very dust of your city, which cleaveth unto us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be you sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. You know the gospel's here, the way of salvation is here. I've got the message. Jesus has sent me with the message, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the penalty for sin is um, death, but the gift is God is eternal life. I'm here and I'm sharing with this. Are you going to accept? And that's what it's all about. Get to know the person you're speaking to. Share and invest in them if they're interested in the message. And then Jesus went on and he talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he talked about if the message of the mighty works had been done in, Eta, in Tar and Sodom, which were done in they, in, so, uh, in Chorazin and Bethsaida. Did I say that right? Chorazin? Chorazin? Okay, in Romanian it's Chorazin, okay? <laughs> C-H is a K, okay? Forgive me if I didn't say that right, okay? And then he went on, he talked about thy Capernaum, which are exalted into the heaven, shall be thrust down into hell. You know what? You know what the mindset was for the Jews? in Israel, was in Tar and Sodom. Oh, have you heard of them cities? Oh, they're port cities. They are wicked cities. You know, all the sailors come in, and they've been away traveling for months, and they come in, and they brought all their goods from various different parts of the world, and they come in here, and they arrive in the port, and they're looking for women of loose reputation, and they're looking, and they're looking for the, where they can have a, 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 a alcohol, and they live this sort of a lifestyle, a lifestyle of debauchery, and the Jews thought, oh, they deserve to go to hell. You know what? Jesus said, hold on, hold on, hold on a minute. You know if the works had been done there in Tar and Sidon that were done here in Chorazin? I said it right? Okay. And in um, Bethsaida. And then he went on to Capernaum, and he said, you guys are so puffed up. You guys here that live in uh, Capernaum, the city where Jesus had spent a lot of his life. Remember, he moved from uh, Nazareth, he moved down, and he had a house there in Capernaum, and he set up business, so to speak, the Lord's business there in Capernaum. You guys are so puffed up, you think you've got it all together. You, everything's all right. You've um, dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. You're on your way to heaven. I tell you what, you're not. Because all the people, uh, all the Jewish people thought, oh, these other guys in Tyre and Sidon, they deserve to go to hell. And Jesus said, hold on, a bit closer to home. You're rejecting the message. The message of salvation, you're rejecting. Very serious business. You know, I've had people, and you go to talk to people about salvation, and there's always the guy there at the side. Is there to make fun of you, they there to ridicule you, and all these sort of things. What a serious thing to be done when they, when they carry on like that. And here we see in verse 14, it should be more, more tolerable for Tar and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Why? Here we see the um, seriousness of rejecting the message of salvation, rejecting the gospel. No, Australia's not in a good place here at the moment. How many people reject the gospel every day? How many people make fun of the gospel message? We've seen a change in society over the last 40, 50 years here in Australia, haven't we? We've seen a downgrade. We've seen the slippery slope, and we're going the wrong way. It's a serious, a serious thing. And around the world, Things are getting worse and worse. As in the days of Noah, I think we're in the days of Noah. As in the days of Noah. And that'll, when the, that'll be when the end comes. Rejection is very serious. I want you to go on with me to verses 17 for 21. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. 
Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And you see the 70 come back. They're very excited. They've just been out on missions. The same people um, come to know Christ the Savior. We've seen the terrain that's been prepared, the ground's been prepared, ready for Jesus to come through that way, through that city, through that village. And they come back and they're, they're excited, they're enthusiastic, they're, 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 they've seen things happen. They've seen the power of God that's worked through them to cast out demons. They've seen um, the power of God that they're able to heal people through Jesus' name. They've fulfilled their calling. How do we go on fulfilling our calling? Do you ever think about that? Oh, but I'm not a missionary, I'm not a pastor, I've never done that. I remember I was on stage when I was about 16 at a youth camp back in Ireland. I was saved there and a man took me under his wing and taught me a bit of door knocking with him. I didn't know what to do in fear and trembling I went with him and he said what you can do to Billy is you can hold my Bible and the tracks. I'll do all the talking and you stand behind me and pray. And if I need another track or I need my Bible to refer to a, a passage of scripture, you just hand it over to me. Just stand next to me. Less than a year later, the, some of the young guys from the youth group came around to my house and they said to me, what are we going to do? It was a Saturday night. It was, they were bored out of their brains. You know, they'd, they'd had, uh, some of these guys were off school, you know, and um, they were a year or two younger than me. And I said, why don't we go door knocking? And they go, well, what's that? Back in Ireland, you door knocking, you went and knocked on someone's door, then you ran away, you know? And <laughs> They didn't know what other door knock. You know, play jokes on people. You door knock on someone's door and you get them, what are you, a bunger? What are you calling? You know, the little thing that explodes, the fireworks, you know, you throw them through a letterbox because the letterboxes are all on the door, on the door. Sir. You knock on someone's door, throw it through a letterbox, and the old lady comes to <laughs> boom. Anyway, for them, that was door knocking, okay? So anyway, I said, door, door knocking. And he said, what do we do? And I said, well, you stand next to me. You hold the... Um, the tracks and the Bible, I'll do all the talking, you stand there and you pray for me. One night, I went to youth group on a, two or three days later, went to youth group on a Tuesday night, I think they held the youth group. I went there and the youth leader, Dennis, was up the front he says, you know, um, some of our young men have been out door knocking. And I said to the guys sitting next to me, did you say anything? No, I didn't say anything. I don't know if I said anything. He said, the only reason I went out door knocking, we know they were out door knocking on Saturday night, is because a man rang me up. Because the tracks the young men were using had my name and phone number on the back of them. And a man rang me up crying on the telephone. I wanted him to come round and talk to him. And he said, this young man came and he spoke to me today about salvation, how I need you to know Christ as Savior. And could you come round and show me how? So Dennis went around and led this man to the Lord, and the man was saved. He said, that's how I know, because the young man had shared the gospel with this man. He was moved, he was ready, he phoned me up, and I went around and um, led him to Christ. That's what we're about. That's what we're here for. We're not on holidays. So the, tw the seven that came back, they're full of enthusiasm, uh, they're very enthusiastic. They've seen the power of God working through them. They've seen the power of God is available to them. And Jesus says, rejoice in this, that your names are written in the book of life. What does he say here? Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What a great peace that is. To know that everything that we do, every time that we share the gospel, every time we live our lives as Christians before people, it's not in vain. Yeah, I look back and I was talking to my wife a few months ago and I said, we've seen some young people come through the church, we've seen them going from the church, we've seen people come in, um, sat in the church for a little while, some people have been in the church for a few years, and we think, what happened? 
the decisions they made and have made are not your responsibility. They came, some stayed, some left, but your work in the Lord was not in vain. And you might think, oh, why did I do this? For what? It's not in vain. They heard the message, they were challenged by it, and the responsibility is theirs. And I like this. In that hour, in verse 21, Jesus rejoiced and said, I thank thee, O Lord, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in my sight. I, I like that verse. Jesus rejoiced. He rejoiced when the 70 came back full of enthusiasm. He rejoiced that they prepared the, the way for him to go into these villages and cities for the gospel message to go forth. For the, message, if, for the, the gospel that they'd shared, that they'd learned from their master <coughs> and the people that had um, received him into their houses. But Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. Do you ever think about your own lives? Jesus rejoiced in the spirit when he hears about you sharing the gospel with someone. Is Jesus rejoicing in the spirit or are you too busy? You know, to be too busy is too busy <laughs> when we think about it. For the seven day had fulfilled their, their calling. Okay, and that's what we're here for. We're here to fulfill our calling. Now I've done what I could to the best of our, my ability. My wife has done what she did to the best of her ability. I want you to think of this. When a, when a man goes out, he's sent out as, as a missionary. His wife's with him. <coughs> okay. Sometimes we get the guy gets up here and he's able to say some things, he's able to preach a message, able to share some things like that. Don't forget about the wife. Okay? And Ed put a lot of work into Kids Club, invested her time in Kids Club, teaching English and many other um, hats that she had to wear. Um, she's been a great blessing to me personally. And the Lord knows that. She's, we've done what we could for the gospel message. There's a little church in Moldova, no one in Romania now, uh, that has seen numbers come, numbers go, things have happened in life, but the fruit is added to your account also, okay? When we invest in people, because the people are what, it, what it's all about, okay? So when we invest in people, you have not done that in vain, okay? Is Jesus happy in you? Does he rejoice with your life? Is that a challenge? Is that too abrupt to say that? I want to challenge you and say, Lord, I want you to be pleased with me. When we get to heaven, we all want to hear them words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We want to hear that. But we want to please him here and now. When I think about those that have pleased God, we think of Enoch, for God saw him and he took him. Took him because he plays God. Are you available to speak for him? The 70 return, they let the Lord work through them. And that's what the Lord is asking us to do. Lord, like Samuel said of old, Lord, speak now for thy servant here. Lord, work through me. I, I might not have much. I may not be highly educated. Many other things, many other things we can say, like not, like uh, Moses, he said, oh, I'm not a great speaker. Oh, Lord, I'm not this. Oh, Lord, I, I'm not a great orator. I, all these different things. God didn't call for you to be anything other than you. Do you know what we have to be? The best you that you can be. That's what he wants you to do. The 70 returned. They left everything in the Lord's hands. They became... Um, <coughs> or a vase, how would you say? For him to use. 
okay? They let him be, they were available to be a channel of blessing as to bring joy to the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring salvation to the ones that are lost. I want you to think about that this week and be challenged by that thought this week. That's what we're here for, okay? Time is fleeting. What is your life? It is just a vapor. It appeareth for a short time, then, then it's gone, isn't it? And only, the only thing that we'll have, we'll be able to hold on to eternity, for all eternity, is those that we've invested our time in by sharing the gospel with people for them to come to know Christ as Savior. That will last. Everything else will go.